Welcome to another Food Addiction Institute bi-monthly webinar. And today, Dr. Martin Lerner will speak for us. He is the founder and executive director of the Milestones in Recovery Eating Disorders program located in Cooper, Florida, Cooper City, Florida, sorry. A graduate of Nova Southeastern University, Dr. Lerner is a licensed and board certified clinical psychologist. He has specialized in the treatment of eating disorders since 1980. He has appeared on numerous national television and radio programs, including NPR Report, 2020, Discovery Health, and the ABC's Nightline, and has offered numerous publications related to eating disorders in the professional literature, national magazines, and newspapers like USA Today, um, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and others. So an active member of the professional community, we are delighted uh, to have him here to talk with us on overconsumptive over eating disorders and where do they fit, or peas in a pod or mixed veggies. So Dr. Marty Lerner, please take it away. I'm looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Well, first off, good morning, everybody. Um, this, uh, typically what we're going to do today in 25 minutes, um, I'm pretty much used to doing it in two to three hours. So I may be talking a little fast or going through the slides more rapidly than perhaps I'm used to. So um, the disclaimer would be that uh, you all are more than welcome to get in touch with me if you have any questions that go beyond the time uh, constraints that we have this morning. Um, and uh, that said, I'm just going to go ahead and forge forward. So um, let's see if I can get this to work. Well. That's funny, I think. We're not being able to uh, to forward the uh, the slides. So we ha oh here he is. Okay, that's my friend. Just thought I'd throw a picture in there. Let's see if we can go a little bit. Yeah. So here's the the uh, uh, excuse the pun the meat and the potatoes of of this little presentation, and um, I'm just going to read this because I think it's relevant um, and. You know, much more often than not, you know, eating disorders, I'll, I'll summarize it, are, are approached more as emotional or psychological problems. Matter of fact, I would say uh, more than 98% of the uh, uh, residential programs and uh, probably an equal percentage of outpatient uh, uh, programs look upon treating an eating disorder from more of a psychiatric, psychological uh, uh, standpoint and tend to look at disordered eating, inclusive of what we're calling food addiction, they may be calling perhaps binge eating disorder, compulsive overeating and whatnot, uh, approaching it more from uh, emotional eating standpoint. And obviously I'm probably preaching to the choir, but from my standpoint, if you're not recognizing and treating the biological drivers of food cravings, um, and overeating. It, it leads to really poor outcomes in my experience. Um, I, this might be going beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but I would even make the case for an addictions model for restricting types of eating disorders, aka uh, anorexia. And if we have time, I'll touch on that thesis as well. Anyway, this is the important tagline here. Um, if nothing else, I hope you'll kind of retain this after. But treatment of an eating disorder really demands attention to the nature of the substance, in our case, the properties of food, the nature of the person, which would be the psychological makeup and all the emotional drivers, as well as the biology of the individual. So um, there are really three entities, if not four, uh, to overconsuming types of eating disorders, as well as uh, restricted eating disorders. It's my little friend. Uh, if you have kids, you probably recognize Cookie Monster. If you're not from this country, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about, but he's a affable little figure that really enjoys chocolate chip cookies. From my estimation, I have diagnosed the Cookie Monster as a, yes, a food addict. So here's what we want to do. We want to look at all what I'm calling eating disorders. So my thesis is basically that, um, you know, there's an addictive component uh, to all eating disorders. 
And whether you want to ascribe 10%, 20%, 80%, 90%, or what have you to biological drivers of the nature of the food, and maybe 10% to the emotional component, or reversing that, maybe 10% to the uh, uh, substance or the food uh, characteristics, and 90% or 50% or what have you to the nature of the person, it's much like alcoholism, drug addiction, compulsive gambling, and other addictions. It usually is a blend of both. Um, we don't recognize, meaning we, the professional community, or the more formal nomenclature in psychiatry and psychology, uh, terms like food addiction, and uh, more recently, orthorexia, which is a, a variant of anorexia that has to do with obsessiveness about the uh, quality of the foods or the health characteristics of the foods. So the real question is food addiction, is it emotional eating or is it biological or is it both? So your guys, you know, you'll have to decide for yourself. Um, so the question more formally is do any, if not all eating disorders, inclusive of food addiction, meet the accepted criteria for a substance use disorder? And more relevant, if so, what are the implications for treatment? My favorite expression is, so what, now what? So real quick review here, um, and this may be redundant information for some of you, but the American Psychiatric Association, in their infinite wisdom, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, that was sarcastic, but nonetheless, they all got together and they decided instead of making uh, all these different definitions for each type of addiction, that they would jettison the word addiction and use the phrase substance use disorders um, and then consolidated all the substances and said, this is what all addictions have in common. Um, tolerance, needing more of the same substance or more of the same behavior to get the same effect. Withdrawal symptoms, which can be emotional and or physical, using for more than uh, intended, unsuccessful effort to cut back or control. Of course, when they're naming these, the least thing in their mind is about food or eating disorders. So when I look at unsuccessful <laughs> effort to cut back or control, how do you spell diet? Uh, significant time to obtain or recover from effects giving up social, occupational, recreational activities because of the substance use and or the behavior, and continuing despite consequences. So they updated all of this, and on the bottom you'll see that they now look at acuity from a mild, moderate, and severe uh, uh, perspective, with mild being uh, getting two or three of these uh, uh, traits, moderate, four to five and severe six plus. And again, they're not looking at food addiction or an eating disorder. Uh, they're looking at alcohol, cocaine, opiates, and process addiction wise or behavioral addiction. They're maybe looking at compulsive gambling. What's interesting to me, real quick aside, is when I pull our patients who are in residential treatment for food addiction, uh, which all include bulimia, uh, bulimorexia, the compulsive overeating and binge eating disorder. Um, if you really take that net and cast it out a little bit more uh, inclusive, what you'll find when I poll these patients is they virtually all meet severe criteria. If I polled the same number of folks that uh, were engaging in alcohol use uh, or even recreational drug use, you would find that the average would be four to five or moderate and um, a percentage, maybe 20 to 30%, might meet the severe criteria, um, whereas my population, granted they're already in residential treatment, uh, virtually all meet severe. So um, giving credit to the Food Addiction Institute and specifically uh, Bill and some of his pioneering work, um, I've taken this from your own literature, and I think it's a very succinct definition uh, of the food addiction perspective of what food addiction is. 
So again, being redundant, I'm just going to read it. Food addiction is a disease causing a loss of control over the ability to stop eating certain foods. Scientifically, food addiction is a, I like this phrase, cluster of chemical dependencies on specific foods or food in general, aka volume, uh, after the ingestion of highly palatable foods such as sugar, excess fat, and or salt. The brains of some people develop a physical craving for these foods. Over time, the progressive eating of these foods distorts a person's thinking and leads to negative consequences they do not want but cannot stop. And I'm going to very briefly go over the neurophysiological aspects of the research. It's a long phrase saying, let's look at the evidence that really supports this, at least in kind. So stay tuned. And this is the argument um, I get when I present at conferences that are not uh, where I'm preaching to the choir, um, such as uh, other eating disorder treatment programs or substance abuse programs or uh, some of my peers at um, some of the uh, other conferences where I present. So the naysayers will all say, hey, drug addiction, alcohol dependency, and process addictions, they're, they're substances and behaviors, but none of them are absolutely necessary for life. And you know, food is necessary for life, so it can't possibly be an addiction. By that token, you could name water and air as an addiction. My argument back to them is that people don't consume water and air beyond their biological needs. Very few treatment programs uh, treat uh, uh, air addiction or water addiction. Um, so perhaps the problem is more semantics. And I'll go one more step. You know, drug addiction is a phrase that you would think all drugs are addictive. Well, I doubt very much that aspirin's addictive. Um, maybe, but I don't see many instances. And not all foods are addicting. So, uh, you know, it's our language that has the limits, not the concept. So here's my thesis uh, uh, for uh, looking at eating disorders at large as an addiction. And I know Phil and I have had kind of a different perspective about all this, but uh, the truth is I treat all the eating disorders, the whole continuum, and I do treat it from an addictions model. And we do use an abstinence food plan, uh, no sugar, no flour, weighing and measuring the volume control across the continuum of eating disorders, inclusive of anorexia. It's just that with anorexia, you're making sure that the nutritional needs are met with appropriate volume. That said, um, and this is more uh, uh, my own quote, but addiction in general is a complex combination of interactions. And again, it's the biology of the addict, perhaps inclusive of, of genetics um, or leptin resistance, insulin resistance. You know, there's a whole cadre of things. The nature of the person, compulsive person, narcissistic person, dependent person, uh, uh, having uh, an addictive personality, non-addictive personality, characteristics of the substances abused, that would be the food, of course, but also the context or the culture these take place in. So from my standpoint, um, you know, some substances can be same substances. One could be medicinal and the other can be recreational. One that comes to light is Adderall, which can be abused uh, as an appetite suppressant or speed. Um, but for some people with ADHD, legitimately, it's, it's medication that uh, uh, does not uh, get them high, but brings people towards reality and uh, uh, can be used for the same drug by someone else who doesn't have that syndrome and will get them high. So it depends on whether uh, the context is uh, in the service of medicinal uh, or treatment or in the service of um, fixing feelings. Uh, and I can go more into that, um, but I certainly wouldn't tell someone not to use an IV with some glucose solution uh, if I was in shock and it was post-surgery uh, because I'm a food addict. So, uh, nor would I have my appendix taken out if I was an opiate addict and tell them not to give me any pain meds. So the, the context does uh, have some relevancy but that's another, another lecture for another time. So uh, nature of the person again, nature of the substance, 
and also the culture or the availability of the substance is the spark that initiates the process. So let me cut to the chase. In my uh, humble opinion, all addictions are about fixing feelings. People do not innately uh, eat to the point of feeling sick or in pain, uh, uh, and they don't uh, innately put their fingers down their throat. And for that matter, no one innately likes the taste of alcohol. They associate it with the effect, and no one innately likes starving themselves to death. So basically, these things, in, at least in the beginning, are in the service of either trying to comfort, fix, or ameliorate uncomfortable uh, or negative feelings. So addictions are about fixing feelings, and recovery is really about transcending them or learning alternatives uh, so that you're not abusing or using food uh, or starvation or alcohol or drugs or any other substance or behavior um, to sidestep uh, learning how to deal. So I'll leave you with this quote, and then we'll get into the treatment section of all of this. Um, I think this is a very succinct quote. Um, uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, I'm gonna, I broke it up into these uh, pieces so, um, uh, so uh, they'll stand out more. But I want you to think about this. Addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. And we'll talk about very briefly dopamine and brains to tree in a second, excuse me. Dysfunction in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in the individual pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. Think about sugar, flour, volume. The addiction is characterized by impairment of behavioral control, craving, inability to consistently abstain and diminished recognition of significant problems with one's behaviors and interpersonal relationships. Like other chronic diseases, this is important. Addiction involves cycles of relapse and remission. Without treatment or engagement in recovery activities, addiction is progressive and can result in disability of premature death. My interpretation of all of this, other than the neurological and biological components or by, you know, uh, that we'll talk about, is you can't just treat an addiction by abstinence from the substance. It involves more, but that is the platform from which recovery does begin. Let's look at the evidence. Looks like I have five more minutes. This might be very quick. <laughs> so let me try. Um, it's my little friend Herman. Uh, what have we learned and what have we studied? Well, um, this is just to give you an appreciation real quickly of just how complicated regulation of appetite or dysfunctional eating is. There are genetic components, reward circuits, um, which will go beyond the scope of this, where there's a release of dopamine uh, with any substance that has a reward effect. If you abuse it or use it too often, you have down regulation and it takes tolerance or more to get the same effect. Trust me, sugar is as addicting for many people as cocaine. Uh, serotonin, that doesn't get you high, but that um, modulates uh, your mood. Not enough serotonin or the reuptake is too slow, you're depressed. Comfort food for most people out there will raise serotonin level. For a food addict, serotonin is necessary to try and combat depression or low mood. Classical conditioning, Pavlov's dog. Um, external food cues will trump, excuse that expression, uh, not to be political, uh, will trump internal cues. Most people with food addiction, and this would deserve a whole other hour of talking, are rather um, uh, uh, unskilled at knowing the difference between appetite and hunger. Hunger or physiological cues, low blood sugar, leptin levels, uh, stomach uh, uh, contractions, and physiological internal cues of when it's important to eat and how much and what to eat. Um, we're more governed if you're a uh, food addict by external cues, uh, which are like time of day, emotions, um, uh, uh, smell of food, thinking about food, talking about food, things outside of uh, of internal physiological processes. Hormonal, uh, ghrelin uh, is uh, the uh, hormone in the stomach. 
that circulates in the bloodstream that signals you need to eat the internal cue. Leptin is the uh, chemical uh, in adipose or fat tissue that tells you when you've had enough. There's something called leptin resistance, which is like insulin resistance, where the leptin, the brake, um, is not working. You need new brake pads, and the ghrelin is the accelerator. So a lot of people have leptin and insulin uh, resistance. Emotional eating we talked about. Processed foods, we could do another hour on that. The more concentrated or processed a substance, the more addictive. You take coca leaves, you produce them and process them into white powder, it's cocaine. You produce that and process it into little rocks, it's crack cocaine, and so on and so forth. When you go up the chain, same thing happens. You take um, a product like uh, uh, sugar cane, you process it into white sugar, then you synthesize uh, high fructose uh, uh, corn syrup, and on and on and on. And the more concentrated and processed, the more addictive. We all know about Bliss Effect and Fritos potato chips are a little bit different than having a medium-sized baked potato. Plasticity cross addiction, uh, there was structural change in the brain. And of course, switching forms of eating disorders, easily to switch uh, from bulimia uh, to anorexia, from anorexia to bulimia, from bulimia to food addiction or compulsive overeating. And last but not least is stress having uh, uh, an influence on our bodies by secretion of cortisol, which for many people creates um, uh, uh, anxiety and anxiety leads to self-medicating with food. It's a couple of volunteers in a study. And by the way, this was replicated a number of times. This doesn't really work as well with humans. It's about a tie. But lab rats will prefer sugared water more than they would prefer uh, cocaine. And there was even an experiment with Oreos, not dipped in milk, but mixed in with rat chow. And the uh, rats did prefer uh, six to one, uh, the adulterated Oreo rat chow over uh, 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 IV uh, cocaine. Hmm. I'm not gonna go into that because we have very little time. I'm gonna skip ahead because I know we're gonna have some dialogue here. I just want to go over um, never enough time. I'll have about a minute to go over treatment. So, <laughs> come on. Oh, Marty, okay. please, you're welcome to take 10 minutes more if you'd like. I mean, it's up to you. Oh, okay. Well, I won't take up too much more time. I'm skipping ahead, and I'm more than happy to come back at another time. And, and go over the research and brain chemistry without it being, you know, overly complicated, but just, you know, just to heighten the point that there is a physiological um, uh, component, obviously, to food addiction that goes beyond just the nature of the food. Um, anyway, um, we treat, we milestones treat uh, all the eating disorders, but the preponderance of what we see are over-consuming types of eating disorders. And yes, I have glumped from an addictions perspective, uh, bulimia, uh, uh, binge eating disorder, and food addiction into uh, uh, you know a same or similar category. So given that these are just basic tenants we use in residential um, and uh, uh, intensive outpatient treatment, and it's the obviously you need to identify and abstain from the addictive food substances. Um, and as Phil has, uh, and the Food Addiction Institute and, and um, some other researchers have uh, attempted to do, you know, there's some people that are more sensitive to uh, refined carbohydrates or simple carbohydrates like sugar and, and white flour, some less sensitive uh, to uh, whole grains, some very sensitive to grains in general, uh, some to high uh, uh, concentrations of fat. Um, some to volume. So you really have to, and where we are from an evolutionary standpoint in the treatment genre is, is trying to individualize somewhat uh, what 
uh, the needs are in terms of an absent and food plan for individuals. The global brush of no sugar, no flour, weighing and measuring still works, but you can fine tune that um, uh, somewhat. So identifying the substance is still very important. I believe, um, and most of us do, that you have to address the mood and the psychological issues. Look, uh, you know, I would say three quarters of the eating disorder and three quarters, if you will, of the food addiction population have a history, either current um, or future or present, of some kind of mood disorder, usually anxiety or depression. It doesn't in itself cause, but contributes to the sustenance of uh, uh, or sustaining uh, compulsive overeating uh, in the service of trying to self-medicate. If you're not treating the mood disorder and or the emotional uh, issues associated with uh, overeating, then I think you're not going to have an outcome that's going to be as well represented if you um, are looking at a multimodal uh, or a comprehensive approach. So we do do that. And at times we do use um, certain medications that are non-addicting, but basically I would make the uh, uh, analogy that those medications like SSRI, uh, antidepressants like Prozac and such, although they can be overprescribed, pretty much even the playing field for some people, um, just like insulin might for a diabetic, or vitamin B12 might be for someone with colitis and so on and so forth. So one can use those judiciously but also in terms of uh, teaching people better coping skills, and that would take another hour to uh, talk about. And very important, as I said, to address physical issues. We screen our patients uh, for being uh, either diabetic type two, um, or being pre-diabetic or having metabolic syndrome. Um, we take into consideration whether their BMI is a standard deviation or more above the norm to look at the possibility of leptin resistance or insulin resistance. Um, and what about people that have other chronic diseases, cardiovascular, uh, hyperlipidemia, and so on and so forth. And depression can be endogenous or chemically based. So again, that would be another discussion in and of itself. But I think screening, or at least acknowledging the probability or possibility that that can exist also needs to be addressed. It would be, um, negligent, in my humble opinion, to treat a food addict who might have a concurrent uh, medical uh, history or issue and, and not address, let's say, um, uh, his need for statins or cardiovascular disease and, and, and not put emphasis on limiting uh, uh, some of his dietary restrictions, you know, with consideration to that. Um, this is a big one, eliminating isolation. All addictions have an isolating you know, element to it. Most food addicts, um, in my experience, eat alone. And most alcoholics in end stage drink alone. And most drug addicts at end stage will drug alone. So part of that teaches people to fear other people or not have a lot of social skills. Regardless of the reason, it's very strong medicine for people to be involved with a community, whether that's a food addiction community, um, interspersed with OA or AA or any of the anonymous programs, or even smart recovery, or whatever floats your boat, just not being alone. Belonging to a group of like-minded people, all with a common purpose, is essential for recovery, along with the spiritual component. So elements of the food plan, again, I'm preaching to the fire, fire, <laughs> Freud was right. Um, <laughs> prescribed by a registered dietitian or someone really familiar with the food addiction model, in my opinion, uh, often, remember, this is what I'm presenting to people that are not familiar with food addiction. Um, involves weighing and measuring the food, uh, consistent schedule of eating three to five times a day, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, congruent with um, a physiological need, um, identifying and eliminating trigger foods. And this is real important. Every food addict 
or eating disorder patient I've ever seen is always obsessed about appearance and weight. However, behaviorally, you want to be focusing not on dieting or weight loss, but on recovery. Big difference. So I encourage people not to weigh themselves or to be weighed backwards just so it's like a blood pressure reading. You're getting a sense of whether you need to add or delete from the volume of your own target from that standpoint. Um, accountability, however you want to do that. Um, it could be a food sponsor, could be in a group, could be writing down your food, whatever floats your boat. And recognizing the nutritional caloric needs are a dynamic process. In other words, if I'm running a marathon, um, I need to adjust my food plan. If I'm ill and I can't uh, exercise as much, I need to adjust my food plan. Um, and there's a thousand different things that happen to us in the course of our lifespan that necessitate making some adjustments. These are the components of our model at Milestones. We do, of course, a structured food plan. We do cognitive behavioral and uh, dialectical behavioral uh, therapy, harm management or, or harm reduction. I will tell you we're not at, uh, how can I frame this? There's a whole thing about dialectical abstinence. Um, I would love to do a half hour seminar about what that means. Um, but it's finding the middle ground in reality about adherence to a food plan. We don't feel that if someone takes an apple and it's not a scheduled uh, part of their food plan, that they don't pick up a white chip or feel that they've had you know, this mammoth lapse. Um, it has a lot to do whether it's planned or not planned or, and talking about perfectionism and so on and so forth. I won't deviate into that. A uh, constructive living model, that's my own thing here. Um, it's more about a lifestyle and a philosophy than psychotherapy. Um, you can read about it in my book. Um, it's free, um, and I love feedback if you do read it. Um, we said concurrent. We see a, a lot of dual diagnosis and tri-diagnosis. We see a very, very, very large contingent of people that have had chemical dependency treatment from the rooms of AA and NA that now have developed full-blown food addiction or an eating disorder. We do a real-world setting. People go shopping uh, with our dietitian. They learn to prepare meals. In other words, you have to live recovery. Intellectual knowledge about it means bupkis. Um, so people here are living recovery. So the last day of their stay here and the next day when they go home should be seamless. We use uh, support groups here, but we give them a sampling from Food Addicts Anonymous to um, OA in general, um, to uh, uh, ABA, Anorexics and Bulimics Anonymous. So they go to a whole cadre or a variety of meetings, and then they can uh, decide for themselves when they return home, which ones work best for them, medication when needed. Evidence-based treatment, um, uh, uh, dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral, but from an addictions model daily living skills, as I mentioned. And we do individual family therapy because you, one size doesn't fit all. Some patients that we see here need what I would call a parentectomy. They, they don't need family therapy, they need to be extracted from the family and, uh, and be able to separate and then reconnect. And other people need education, a husband and a wife. Husband, let's say, is a food addict. The wife needs some education about what really food addiction is and maybe not to store, you know, uh, certain foods in the house if possible, et cetera. Ah, this is my favorite. Uh, this is, uh, there's halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. For food addiction, it's spirituality, exercise, rest, and food plan. I won't go into it because we're running out of time. You can see it in the book. Um, but this is, uh, this is my own flavor of an anachronism. Uh, it's my answer to halt for food addicts. Um, and um, this is what I present to the naysayers. All truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. And Schopenhauer uh, made a lot of quotes, uh, but this was my favorite. Um, this is the book. You can go to the website and you can ask for it. It's totally free. Um, uh, it's, I've written four different versions of it because as I learned from you all, 
and from the literature and from some research, I kind of add to it. Um, so the latest version is available. It's again, totally free. It probably is more or less uh, preaching to the uh, choir here, but I think it'll cover most of what we talked about today and maybe answer some lingering questions. So um, if you need to get in touch with me or whatever, you can, uh, uh, I guess, copy and uh, uh, print out that part of the screen. And whoa, I did this in a half hour. Well, that's all folks. Marty, that's very impressive, very quick. Could you, uh, you flipped by one of my favorite uh, pictures and it's the one of Tenny and the chocolate milkshake. I go back to it. Could you go back to that and just comment just for a moment on that? Yeah. Thank you. The issue. the issue is once an addict, always an addict. Um, and, you know, whether it's alcohol or whether it's drugs or even a process addiction like compulsive overeating. This was on, uh, aired on ABC News, I guess it was 2020 or whatever. Um, but it, uh, on the left is, um, her name is Tenny McCarthy, and she is a food addict. She had di uh, best gastric bypass surgery, didn't work, and has a long history and has done a lot uh, to further uh, the uh, uh, dissemination of knowledge about food addiction. And on your right is just a, I call a Harry, who I grew up with, who I'd like to see die slowly and painfully, who never had any addictions whatsoever, and could take a bite of cake and say, I've had enough and push it aside. You know the type. Um, anyway, Tenny, after a number of years of abstinent eating, did volunteer to have a, uh, what's called a functional MRI, um, uh, and uh, which is a picture of the concentration of dopamine in, in one's brain. And she looked before getting a uh, milkshake to drink, which of course is fat, sugar, and you know, it's just everything that's non-abstinent. And so after a long period of abstinence, her brain looked like the right side, like my friend Harry, and then took this in the uh, uh, MRI, and what you're seeing in red and yellow is dopamine exploding in her brain. Harry, whoever that was, had the same, as the control subject, had the same experience uh, with the milkshake, but only lit up like you're seeing on the right side. The way I look at it, if I had, um, being a food addict myself or history, um, but I'll use also, you know, alcohol as an, an example for me. If I had a shot of tequila and then another shot of tequila, um, my brain, or I had a milkshake, my brain would look at the left side. It would light up like a Christmas tree. And I would, I would make that analogy that the other brain, the normal brain, would look like a little firecracker went off my brain would look like a whole pack of firecrackers went off. So that's the difference. But that could happen five days into abstinence, five years into abstinence, and 10 years, and God knows how long into abstinence. The problem is that after the first milkshake or after the first experiences, in short order, you retain the tolerance. And then no matter how much you have, your brain starts to look like Harry's brain, and you're consuming a ton of the substance. So I hope that explains it a little better. And what I was uh, gonna show on this slide is classical conditioning. If you hang around the mall and you pull up a chair in front of Mrs. Fields' uh, chocolate chip cookies, Harry, the control, his brain would light up a little bit. You know, we'd smell the cookies and condition response would be measured by that concentration of dopamine. That is a binge eating disorder patient uh, being exposed to slides of Mrs. Fields cookies. So moral of the story, external cues, remember what I said about being oriented towards more external than internal cues, sight of food, smell of food. Look, if you're abstinent, you don't want to take your family to China Buffet. End of story. Marty, thank you very much. Oh, do you want to?
talk about no, reward? Uh, that's just, no. no. It okay. will be another time. All right. To the slides. Well, thank you so much. And now we have an opportunity to ask questions. At the um, bottom of your screen, Marty, I think there are two questions. One of them I can answer. Will there be a link to the recorded webinar? And that is absolutely true. David Wolf, our uh, board member and techie person, will be putting that up on YouTube. And you're welcome to go to the Food Addiction Institute site to look at any of the previous webinars that are already there on the link. But then there's another question. And Marty, would do you see the chat? No. The, do you no. see the Q and A? No. I'll ask you the question then. Brenda Brenda Illif asks, Are you or is the research showing any promise for the anti-craving medications used in substance abuse as a tool? By the way, great presentation. Yes, uh, but very limited. Um, science may. Um, find a solution to some addictions at some point, but yet to do so. I think that's a paraphrase of a quote in some book I've read. Anyway, um, here's the story. Campbell, um, and for food addiction or obesity contrary, um, naltrexone, Topamax, Topamax and naltrexone together is sort of like contrary, um, and uh, uh, ant abuse and uh, yeah, the problem is that it's of limited value. And here's, here's my argument. The reason is, if I gave you an naltrexone, it would short circuit the reward circuitry somewhat in the body. So it would make the incentive or reward experience from sugar, let's say, or from uh, opiate, or from whatever substance, um, it would make it almost non-existent or would lower the threshold greatly. But what about the component that is conditioned or psychological or emotional? So you're only controlling a small part of the physical, but you're not controlling the nature of the person, and you're not controlling uh, the uh, learning history and all the other complex components, leptin levels, and on and on and on. So it could be for some people um, uh, a tool, but I wouldn't rely on any medication to be a silver bullet in any addiction across the board. Um, there were a couple of chats also. Um, one of them is, says uh, from Demita, a great webinar, an insightful presentation. The slides were helpful and encouraging regarding abstinence results. External cues directly affect the senses. And um, would you share some more on that perspective, yeah. the holistic approach? To sure. We call them in, in, in recovery triggers. You can't avoid all the triggers in the world. You'd be sequestered in your room all the time. Um, however, there are certain external cues or conditioned pieces that you can re-engineer. For instance, um, if you go out to eat, uh, you, you don't want to depend on a menu and, and a level of having not eaten in a while to decide what to eat, even if you're you know, weighing and measuring. But most people don't take a scale into a restaurant. But the reason for that is, uh, huh, I'll tell you what Denny's did knowing this. They experiment, are you ready for this? They, they not only have pictures of what like a cheeseburger looks like and, you know, and, and um, cheesecake and all this other stuff. They were experimenting with scratch and sniff menus. You know how like you get perfume and you scratch and sniff? They were doing it with foods, except they all blended together and they scrapped it. My point is sight of food, smelling food, and taste of food, sugar-free, Fat-free, it has no calories. Yogurt with artificial sweetener affects some food addicts more than others, but the taste is an external cue, believe it or not. So if something tastes too sweet, that could trigger you. Smell, so common sense is you wanna limit some of these triggers and identify which ones have very strong conditioning effects on you. Here's a big one for me, was um, uh, anxiety. 
Um, you know, I grew up and my mother would say when she was very upset or anxious or whatever, she would say, I'm too upset to eat. And my story would be, I'm too upset not to eat. So an external cue might be an emotion that's caused by somebody else and learning how to navigate that emotion, not control the feeling per se, but control how you cope with it or what you do in response to it would be an example of honoring the influence of external cues. Um, I can go on and on and on with it, but just think in terms of all your five senses. Thank you, Marty. Another question, in your experience or your treatment centers, what is the biggest trigger or one of several that is a warning sign for people with longer term recovery? For example, over five years, are people getting into therapy with long term recovery? Um, I'm going to make this more broad response. In my experience across the board with all addictions, there are a couple of um, warning signs that happen before someone picks up, if that's the phrase to use. Um, and sometimes you can go, these can go on for weeks or days or hours, really it can vary. But one is honesty. When the honesty breaks down, even if it's unrelated to the substance, that's a big warning sign. Um, inclusive of self-honesty. The other is ego. To me, ego is like a weed. It, it, you know, you can work a program, but it constantly grows back and you constantly need to weed the garden, so to speak. And the reason I say that is ego isn't always of the, I hope I don't get political, of the Trump variety where it's grandiosity. Um, uh, it also is in terms of the opposite of always feeling less than um, or body image issues or what have you. And for food addicts, it's normally on the left of grandiosity rather than on the right side of grandiosity. But be that as it may, on either side, one needs to look at humility um, as, a, um, as something to strive for on a fairly consistent basis, however you want to do that. Um, I believe that that's what the steps are intended to do when they bring you to a um, kind of a spiritual awareness, wherever that is for you. Um, so I would say honesty, uh, humility, um, and, um, and I know this is cliche, but willingness, um, staying green, helping others. So it's really, you know, components I've learned um, in, in uh, recovery rooms. Um, and when those start to fade, or, or you're not you know, doing maintenance of your recovery. In my experience, personally and professionally, you start to move towards uh, the substance or the behavior um, that brought you there. Thank you. And another question, uh, if, can you share a bit more on impulse control and what the research says? Oh, great question. Yes, I can. Ah. This, I could talk for days about this one, the brain. Um, <laughs> remember young Frankenstein and, and Igor dropped the normal brain and then he had to get the jar with the abnormal brain? Um, <laughs> uh, hmm. Well, here's the deal. When you, you have two areas of the brain. One is kind of this, you've heard of this, the reptilian. It's the one that, that is the reward center. It's called the amygdala or the nucleus, nucleus accumbens, doesn't really matter what it's called, but it's, it's really lower brain, near the brain stem. And it just wants to either feel good or avoid pain. Um, you can take a lizard and, it ha and its life um, is, is controlled by either finding food or avoiding getting killed. Um, or more simply put, finding reward or avoiding punishment. That said, we're no different. We still have that part. So if something feels good, we want more of it. Well, what mediates that? I mean, what makes us different, you know, than, than, than my dog who will eat anything um, is something in the, in the forebrain that we evolved, which is called the prefrontal cortex. What's housed there is impulse control, judgment, reasoning, and really higher functioning. 
Now, what happens with addiction is something feels good, right? Goes to that nucleus accumbens or the amygdala area. And for some reason, if, if you do it more often than not, you can develop an addiction. And what happens with that addiction is it creates a strong response or tie or neural connection to that nucleus accumbens at the expense of weakening the connection to the prefrontal cortex. So um, over time, the prefrontal cortex, as it relates to the addictive substance or behavior, becomes weaker, and the amygdala gets reinforced and has more uh, plasticity or stronger connections. Now, here's what the research is showing us. I want you to think about the driving age and drinking age being 18 in some states versus 21 versus 25. The prefrontal cortex in terms of development doesn't fully mature until about age 22 to 25 in human beings. So when you give a 16 year old a driver's license, he's driving more or less with an undeveloped prefrontal cortex. So you tell me if you have a 16 year old had one, what their impulse control, <laughs> what their judgment, decision-making looks like as opposed to a 25 or 30-year-old. Much different. Now, if you take a 30-year-old and you put them, you know, into an addiction camp with alcohol, with drugs, or with um, uh, uh, food, um, what will happen is that piece of prefrontal cortex will be like a 16-year-old. And what will happen, even though they think they're functioning as an adult, they're functioning, you know, as a reptile or a 16-year-old. And it really is, even though they won't admit it to themselves, if it feels good, do it. Hopefully I've explained this, but that's what the research is showing. Can you, can you change that? Um, <laughs> no. Unless you want to do a, a, a full-blown prefrontal lobotomy or something. Can you change the neural uh, structure over time? Guess what? You can. Because what will replace that is spirituality or other components of, of programs or non-isolation or other behaviors that are rewarding. They're just not as immediately rewarding or as intense, but, but that will lessen the connection. In other words, over time, even though there's sensitivity, just like we saw on that slide, the prefrontal cortex will become um, more or less normalized um, over time with abstinence. But it only takes one experience to weaken it. Best I can do to explain it. Very well done. Thank you. Another question. How, um, oh, sorry, when I've had one too. Uh, what are you seeing with eating disorders developed in later life, 50 or plus, 50 plus? Yeah, I mean, and that is a growing phenomenon uh, or phenomenon. Uh, think of it this way. Two things. I'm going to give an analogy. One's physical and one's emotional or both. We're seeing that people that have had gastric bypass surgery, whether it's sleeve or Y section or whatever the procedure is, that about a year afterwards, they relapse either into uh, overeating and compensating and regaining the weight, or they develop late stage alcohol dependency. The reason for that is twofold. One is, um, the alcohol in a smaller area will be reabsorbed into the brain uh, barrier much quicker. But the other is if the nature of the person is an addict and psychologically they've self-medicated with food and they can no longer self-medicate with food, medicate with food, I'm not thinking of the healthcare act, medicate with food, um, they'll turn to the next, you know, the next player or they'll switch addictions. I call it switching chairs on the Titanic. They'll go to alcohol. 
So they may have been a social drinker, now they're morphing into an alcoholic because they can't be a food addict anymore. Now, late, age, late stage anorexia, bulimia, and compulsive overeating, what we're seeing um, is basically uh, at 40, 50, and 60, what's happening to people is they're meeting, uh, there's a great book called Passages. There's another stage in life where maybe their, their kids have left the nest or there's some uh, market change in their life that's very stressful, a divorce, a new career, ending a career, retirement, I mean, you know, an illness, what have you. And, and maybe they've overeaten and they've been kind of this Weight Watchers population, but now they cross over a line because the stress is so great that the one thing that they were doing to feel a little comfort or feeling a little bit better now takes center stage and becomes more important. Or they may turn to uh, bulimia or anorexia as a misguided attempt to get control over their life. That feels like it's out of control. Lots of reasons. Thank you. And one last quick question uh, about triggers and identification of those. What about those people who have identified many triggers but are stuck in denial regarding one favored substance? Give me an, an example. I'm not quite sure. What you um, the one that I wonder about the most frequently is those people who continue to eat grains, even though that may be a trigger for them, but it hadn't been earlier in their abstinence or earlier in their lives. Yeah, that's more of a controversial issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is, is how does one know that? Um, if, if, if you believe that, um, that's, that, that something is missing from your recovery because you keep relapsing or you're having cravings or whatnot, the science doesn't allow us to definitively say you have celiac disease you know, per se or an analogy to that, you know, maybe with grains or something. So what ends up happening is you need to, by trial and error, experiment. So if someone came to me and said, you know what, I'm not sure I need to give up grains or not, I really don't want to. Um, what I would say to them is, well, you know, if, if, if it's on your mind that that's a possibility, why not take a period of time and abstain from that and see if it makes a difference? I say the same thing to people about sugar or flour or weighing and measuring or any component that's suspect um, with an eating disorder um, or food addiction. So sometimes you don't know you have a problem with something until you eliminate it. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate you being a participant in our Food Addiction Institute webinar, Smarty Learner. Thank you. And um, David, can you put up the information with regard, or can one of you put up the information with regard to your contacts so that they can take another yeah. look at that? And um, David Wolf, whose picture is um, maybe available on your screen, Again, we'll place this on the YouTube for Food Addiction Institute, and there is a link for our previous ones and for this one as soon as he gets it up. So, Marty, can you put up your slide that has your your um, contact info? Yeah, uh, I'm just going to put this up for the website okay. on top, so it'll kill two birds with one stone. Okay. It'll go to somebody if you want to request a, a electronic copy to be emailed to you of the book. You can just open it and read it. Or if you want a hard copy, they're free. Um, you can request that, and um, or you can email me through that website. Outstanding. And thank you so much. And we're very grateful that you participated today with us. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you again at our next one in July. Thank you. Bye. Thank oh, you. Bye.